Go ahead and shoot. You'll be doing me a favor. In this video, I'm going to invent the sequel to the great movie Casablanca in order to teach a little trick about plotting which I discovered a while back. It was inspired by an email I got from a viewer who complained that she found plotting really hard. And I knew I know what she meant because I used to as well. I used to sit at a keyboard just overwhelmed by the task. It reminded me of the old joke, writing is easy, you just sit at the keyboard and bleed. But then I happened to read one of the saddest books ever written, and I gained an insight from it into the, the nature of plotting, which not only makes it easier, it actually makes it a breeze. So I'm going to share it with you. So welcome to another instalment in my series on how to write your novel using that most unlikely of writing implements, a round Oxford bus ticket. For inspiration, I've taken bus number two down to St. Giles, and I'm heading to this bookshop, this second-hand bookshop, and I've come in search of a specific book. It's a, it's a book which made a great impact on me as a teenager. It contains all the love and joy and heartache and melancholy and loss and despair of life in kit form. It's the Thomas Cook European Rail Timetable, and as a teenager I spent hours poring over the pages, working out the various journeys I would make, and uh, visualising those, those dusty ticket barriers where she would be waiting. She, the, the beautiful girl, the girl that the universe had created just for me. Well, I never found her, but I did gain a valuable insight into plotting. My insight hinges on something quite simple, but which a lot of people get wrong. The difference between plot and story. Well, I'm going to explain the difference and show how understanding it can give us a method which makes plotting fairly straightforward. And then I will show you in practical terms how that works by inventing the sequel to Casablanca. So we'll start with story. Story is a journey of personal transformation that the main character undergoes. The hero starts off the tale with something lacking in his world. He sets off on an adventure in search of something greatly desired, the symbolic grail, and he struggles to achieve it, and in the course of the struggle, the wound on his soul is healed. This is the journey from chrysalis to butterfly, the ugly duckling turning into the swan, the metamorphosis of Cinderella. Now, plot is a series of external events we use to tell the story. Imagine, for example, you are planning to make a great tour of Europe, and you decide there will be five key points, the capitals Paris, London, Rome, Vienna, Berlin. Well, once you've decided those, your next step is to work out the intermediate steps to get from capital to capital. Similarly, imagine your story features five core elements equivalent to the capitals, and these are the original suboptimal state. The quest, the struggle, the spiritual crisis, happiness. So to make your plot, you just have to think up interesting stages, intermediate stages. And in order to help you with that, you need two key ingredients. The first is causality. Every action must be causally entailed by what went before. I've actually made an entire video on causality using, I think, for the first time in literature, the metaphor of a flatulent donkey. So I don't want to repeat myself here, so I'll link to that video in the notes below. The other key ingredient is tension. We need to do this to the reader. Put them on the rack. Make them squirm. Give them hell. But don't worry, they seem to like it. And the simplest way to generate tension is to put the hero in jeopardy and then dial up the threat and difficulties. And you start with the biggest one, the key one, the biggest source of tension of all, namely, what is at stake? The hero's quest cannot be an idle jaunt. It has to be a matter of life or death. A failure is not, a, not an option. It would be, failure would be a personal catastrophe. OK, this is getting pretty theoretical, so we will illustrate it with a made-up example. Well, the movie Casablanca ends on the airport tarmac, doesn't it, as Rick, the character played by Humphrey Bogart, forces Ilza, the woman he loves, to leave with Laszlo, her husband, while he stays to fight the Nazis. Well, we can imagine the scene 13 years later, and the movie will be called Day of the Badger. So let's start with stage one. Stage one, suboptimal state. 
So this is Rick now living in Saigon in 1956. During the war, he joined the French Foreign Legion and saw action in North Africa. And then when the war ended, he was sent to the Legion to Indochina for the first Indo-Chinese war against the forces of Ho Chi Minh. Now he's out of the Legion and he works as a barman. And like many old soldiers, when the war is over, he feels like he's been thrown onto the scrap heap. He feels betrayed and he is consumed with regret because he, he realises that the one chance he had in life for happiness with Ilza, that he blew it. Kiss me. Kiss me as if it were the last time. So we begin, this is his suboptimal state. So we begin the movie with him throwing his medals into the Saigon River. But then he gets the call to adventure, which takes us to stage two. Stage two, the quest. A letter arrives from Casablanca. It's from a priest working in a hospice run by a religious order. And Ilza is dying. And she wants to see Rick for one last time, but only has a few days to go. So these are the stakes. Ilza, the only woman he loved, she's dying and she wants to see him. And he has to get to Casablanca urgently. And our role as dastardly authors is to do everything we can to stop him. So the reader will be in a constant state of tension, wondering, will he make it or not? And then we will dial up the tension by using some of the following simple, straightforward, time-honoured storytelling devices. Put the hero in danger. Bring the danger closer. Increase the magnitude of the danger. Reduce the time available to fix things and confront the hero with an impossible choice. So Rick flies to Paris for... Stage 3. Struggle. Rick has his luggage delivered to the hotel, but there's been a mix-up, and they send the wrong suitcase. The, the suitcase belongs to the notorious hitman, Carlos the Badger, who is planning to assassinate Crown Prince Somebody in the West, well, the West African state of Ungdala. Well, you know what that means, don't you? It means a bloodbath will be unleashed in Ungdala. The hit is scheduled for, scheduled for Bastille Day. So now let's establish the threat to Rick. We cut to Carlos the Badger briefing his accomplice to find Rick, retrieve the suitcase and kill Rick. Well, now Rick's in jeopardy. And we see the assailant lying in wait as Rick pops out from the hotel to buy some cigarettes. Well, he's going to be, be killed. So we try another time-honoured device, the cliffhanger. Just as the bad guy is about to kill Rick, we cut away to Casablanca, where Ilza is dying. Now, we could incorporate some sort of subplot here so the reader spends more time with Ilza in Casablanca and more time worrying about Rick. And then we cut back to the hotel where Rick overpowers the bad guy and ties him to the chair. And he tortures him by taking the electrical cable from the TV and attaching it to the poor man's testicles. Well, the man spills the beans and tells Rick about the the hit which is due to take two days later in Toulouse. The, the, hit, the, the, the assassin has taken a room in a house overlooking the ruder thingy bob. So Rick heads off to Toulouse with the intent of catching the guy, thwarting the assassination and retrieving his suitcase. So now we up the ante and increase the peril. The tied up man escapes and tips off the police. So they're looking for Rick now because they believe he's Carlos the Badger. And we see the detective briefing his men and he says that this Carlos the Badger is a very bad guy. And if they should try and arrest him and in the, in the, in the process he gets shot to death, well that wouldn't be a bad outcome. So they're going to murder him in cold blood. We see the police marksman taking aim at Rick through his telescopic rifle sight. But just then a little girl passes, a girl chasing a puppy passes in front of the, the gun and the cop cries out in frustration and this alerts Rick who runs and makes an escape. And later we see him going to the post office where he's had his mail forwarded and there's a telegram from Ilza begging him to hurry up. So now we confront him with another great storytelling device, the, the impossible choice. So Rick can do one of two things. He can hurry off to Casablanca and see Ilza before she dies, or he can avert the bloodbath, but he can't do both. And the pain of this sort of impossible choice incapacitates him and he, gets, he lets his guard down and he's arrested. And he tells the detective the truth. But the detective doesn't believe him. He thinks he's Carlos the Badger. All the same, he goes to the Foreign Legion headquarters in Marseille to check up on Rick. And 
He finds that Rick was Rick achieved great renown as a marksman when he was uh, in the Legion. So this just confirms his suspicions. But he also finds a letter there addressed to Rick in his file. And so he takes it along and gives it to Rick. Stage four, crisis. Which brings us to stage four. Rick is alone in his cell and experiences complete spiritual collapse. He has failed in his attempt to avert the bloodbath and failed to get to Lisa. All is lost. And he opens the letter and finds it, con it contains a photo of Le Ilza and Laszlo and their child, a little girl in a ballerina costume. Well, this is the final insult. She obviously never loved him. He tears up the photo and weeps and decides to take his own life by hanging from the light fitting. Well, now with Rick about to die again, it would be a good time to introduce another cliffhanger. So we will cut away for a short commercial break. Imagine a thousand years into the future, an alien spaceship lands on Earth. No trace of human civilization now remains apart from the great ruined cities. The aliens explore and find a desk miraculously preserved. And inside the desk is a novel. It's yours. But you didn't finish the damn thing, did you? You've let the whole human race down. Well, don't let this happen. Sign up for my free 10 part novel writing e course, Gateway to Narnia. The link is in the notes below this video. So, standing on the chair, Rick's gaze falls on a newspaper on the floor and he reads the headline. And then he has, well, excuse the pun, but he has a light bulb moment because he realizes that the hit is not due to take place on Bastille Day during the parade, but tomorrow as the Archduke drives in from the airport. And he knows now that the assassin has taken this room in Rue de Thingybob, and that's where he will shoot from. And it's tomorrow, and this is another time-honoured way of dialing up the tension. A time lock. He's going to run out of time. Well, he must act to stop it. He fakes his own suicide by making it appear that he hanged himself from the light fitting and then fell to the floor. So he makes a loud crash and the warders rush in, see what's happened and put him in an ambulance and take him to hospital. Well, he escapes from the hospital and by the magic of storytelling, he finds his way to the Rue de Thingybob and he kills the assassin and he f finds his suitcase and heads off to Marseille and stage five. Stage five. Happiness. So Rick takes the steamer to Morocco, and we see him on deck staring at the photograph, which we notice has been taped back together again with sticky tape. And he smiles the smile of a man deeply at peace with the world, because he's figured it out. He's figured out why Ilza sent him the picture of the little ballerina. That girl is his daughter. This is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. 